and welcome to the Research Works podcast, brought to you in association with Curtin University and the Healthy Strides Foundation. Your hosts are Dr. Dana Poole and Dr. Ashley Thornton, and together we will interview world-leading researchers in the area of child health to support your practice in being more evidence-based. The team at the Research Works podcast acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land and waters on which we live and work. We pay our respects to all First Nations peoples, elders past and present, and would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we record this podcast each week, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation. We recognise their continued connection to this beautiful Buja we call home. Hello, everyone. Another week and another great episode of the Research Works podcast. Yes, welcome, everyone. We hope you've been enjoying your week. I know Dana and I certainly have. Oh, we have been. <laughs> We've been enjoying lots of really diverse chats. I feel like my brain has expanded. I've learned so much over the last few weeks, and uh, and today is no exception. No, yeah. and a, a topic very close to to both of our hearts. I think on yes. the podcast this week, we'll be talking all things participation from an incredible leader in this area, Professor. So Christine Ims. Welcome, Christine. Thanks very much, Ash and Dana. It's lovely to be here. Well, it's so nice to have you. You've been very excited about yeah. this, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we feel very privileged that you are taking some time out of your schedule to join us today. Well, let's tell you a little bit about Christine. Christine is an occupational therapist, researcher and educator with clinical and academic research experience. In 2011, Christine was appointed Professor of Occupational Therapy at the Australian Catholic University. In 2020, Christine was appointed Apex Australia Chair of Neurodevelopmental and Disability at the University of Melbourne and the Royal Children's Hospital. Based in the Melbourne Children's Campus, this role is focused on outcomes that improve the lives of children and families when there is childhood onset disability. She also holds an honorary research role at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne and is an associate member of CanChild. Christine's research has focused on investigating and optimising the participation of children and youth with disability and their families. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And I would have to say from the outset that uh, a lot of Christine's work has really influenced my practice, like in terms of making me think differently. And um, and, I, and I always feel like I have conversations after with Christine where I'm thinking so much more deeply about something. You have mm. this ability to make me do that, Christine. And it's a bit scary <laughs> that you can do that to me, but um, it is it is wonderful. <laughs> um, but it's always challenging and I absolutely love that. So I think everyone's going to love this episode today. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, Christine, that's the formal getting to know you part. And then we <laughs> have <you>. the, <laughs> the informal getting to know you part, which is our icebreaker question. And today's question is, obviously, aside from the Research Works podcast episodes, <laughs> what <laughs> podcast episode or TED talk or presentation have you enjoyed listening to recently? Yeah, that's a great question, and I'm sitting here in the very fortunate position of having just flown around the world and oh. been able to attend two different conferences, so wow. um, have actually heard a large number of really excellent presentations. So the first set in the beautiful mountains of Norway at the Capture the Magic Participation Conference, and, and I guess for me, you know, that, that was a series of keynotes and really excellent presentations and workshops. But one that really stood out for me was a, a brief presentation um, that really focused on experiences where courage was required and building bravery and, and thinking about that from a participation perspective. So that was one. And then, then I... Uh, had a little culture shock and flew to Las Vegas uh, and, and att attended the American Academy uh, of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine and, again, an, an incredible array of presentations and um, keynotes that really focused on, on issues that really matter for people um, growing up with disability or raising children with a disability. Wow. That's that's amazing. Yeah. Well, how, how nice time to have two conferences like that as well, to be yeah. able to do that. That's beautiful. And such a juxtaposition <laughs> yeah, of locations as well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, very yeah. different environments, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's really cool. Well, what about you, Dana? So my, <laughs> mine isn't particularly academic though. Mine, look, how I got into podcasts really was serial mm. and, but I didn't get into it. I think it was 2014 when it first came out. I really only got into podcasts in the last few years and, and my husband put me onto it and I was like, oh, I don't really want to know much about, you know, serial 
things. It sounded a little bit too scary. <laughs> but it was the first season. It was about Adnan Syed and I was captivated. I'd go on my runs, listen, like I would run so long every day just so I could listen to these episodes of what would happen. And I was like, don't Google to see what happened to him. Then I was devastated when I found out what happened to him. But then recently it was all good news and yeah. I'm really excited about it. So I really, really enjoyed that series. But something a bit more serious, I do listen to a lot of things about um, just personality and leadership and growth and things mm. along those lines. So mm. I'm really enjoying those kind of podcasts yeah. when I want to be a bit more serious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I think Serial was the gateway podcast for me as well. Yeah. So yeah. That's very, we have very <laughs> similar experiences in that <laughs> front. I have been listening on and off to a, a podcast called The Imperfects, which is uh, hosted by Hugh Van Kylenberg, who is the founder of The Resilience Project. And he hosts that podcast with Ryan Shelton, who is a comedian. Uh, so you'd think it's quite a, a light kind yeah. of um, show, but actually they have some really meaningful and in-depth conversations about being vulnerable, what that means to to be vulnerable. Yeah, They speak to a lot of well-known uh, national and international guests about their experience of, of vulnerability and leadership and uh, empowerment. And I, I always take something away from yeah, the episodes. The so most good. recent one was with Dr. Kieran Martin, who is the founder of ASHA. Um, ASHA is a, a non-government organization that um, builds health and community facilities in the slums of India. And she is just the most incredible person Love I have that. ever listened to. So wow. inspiring. And her messages around leadership and empowering the people around you were so yeah. powerful and yeah. I yeah I loved it oh that's so good I feel like we've grown up a lot like I don't <laughs> I don't go for runs listen to music anymore no. I listen to podcasts no. <laughs> <laughs> well apart from that you know this is a great podcast so just to you know shameless plug make sure you do subscribe yes <laughs> yes please do <laughs> All right, so now let's get into the actual content of what we want to talk about today. And just to start really broadly, so Christine, I know you've written many, many articles and one of your most cited articles was published in 2017 in Developmental Medicine, Child Neurology. And that one was titled Participation, Both a Means and an End, a Conceptual Analysis of Processes and Outcomes in Childhood Disability. Now, I mean, I've read this so many times. I keep going back to it because of the amazing framework that you've got in there. And I've, we've discussed it at length, you know, mm. with a lot of colleagues. And so I thought this would be a really great place to start. You know, what sort of prompted you to write this paper with an amazing set of um, authors there? In, and why is it like an entry point and an end point? Like, what does all that mean? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Um, yeah, that paper came at the end of quite a long journey, I think, of, um, of other research, actually. But uh, yes, it, it is really important to see participation as both a means and an end. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have traditionally viewed participation as the end point mm -hmm. of an intervention or a health service delivery or education or whatever, really. Yeah. Um, we really focused on... Um, providing an intervention, providing supports, um, information, whatever it is that we're, we're doing as therapists, and with the expectation that development of the child or the building of skills or fixing of a problem would result in participation. So mm -hmm. that's sort of participation as an ends. And my good colleague, Matt Scranlib, would call that um, intervene and hope. <laughs> so, so you know I think um that's kind of cheeky but 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 actually it, it sums it up yeah, it and does, yep. you know when we think about um the the word participation really only came into our conversation as as um, rehabilitation specialists and therapists um, allied health professionals in the in 2001 when the ICF was published but I'm always really keen to say that actually it's not that we weren't thinking about participation before that but we used a different set of language and mm. in occupational therapy we did talk about participation yeah, yeah. before that and you know but it became very much part of the language of the health professions if you like with the publication of the ICF so um, so that kind of put it on the map yeah. and so and it put it on the map in a in a picture yeah. Um, so the ICF was always a classification system. It was meant to sit alongside um, the World Health Organization's International Classification of Diseases. Mm. So it was really meant to be a, um, a tool for classifying. Um, but the beauty of it was that they also developed the framework, so that, that um, disability and health and functioning framework. Mm. And participation got a box of its own yeah. in the framework. <laughs> and, um, and I just went, 
great, right, we're all on the same page now, yeah. we can do this. But in actual fact, even though that framework has all those arrows that have two ends on them and things are supposed to flow in all sorts of directions and be dynamic, mm. we still, as therapists very much started, still were thinking fix the body, build the activity skills, and then the participation yes. will happen. And, mm. yes, of course, the environment will matter or who you are will matter or your health condition will matter. Mm. But we, we were still very much thinking linear, linearly, yeah. I think, yeah. um, with participation as an end. Yeah. So why um, do I think it needs to be a means? Yeah. I guess it's yeah. the other half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and the, the bottom line is that actually we have no good evidence, very little evidence, that by changing body function, functions and structures we make any difference to participation. Mm. We have to have a massive change at the level of fixing a body function or a body structure to really influence participation. Mm. Now, just to be careful, I would say it's possible to really interrupt participation with an impairment, mm -hmm. definitely. Yes. Um, but I don't think that just fixing things um, is going to necessarily lead to participation. And so what we then say is actually it's participating in life situations that really builds your functions and your capacities and your skills and your capabilities and your can do. Um, and it's actually that participation that really matters. So if we start there, then we're going to build capacity for participation. Yeah. And we can improve skills, so activity performance, yeah. and we can improve body functions and body structures through participation. Yeah. So we're much more likely to have an influence back the other direction if we start with participation as a means. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but living your life is done by participating. Mm. It's not so, you know, that, that's the means to a good life. And so if we really support people to live the life they want to live mm -hmm. in the here and now, mm. they'll have skills for future participation as well as all those other things. Gosh, yeah, that's well said. Yeah. Absolutely well said, yeah. 100%. <laughs> I don't really have anything else to say to that. <laughs> yeah. So, Christine, I think you've probably touched on there, you know, what we wanted to talk about next, which was the ICF. And I know, you know, all of the clinicians who are listening to this episode will be very well versed in, in the mm. ICF. And we've touched a bit on the, the limitations mm. of incorporating ICF domains when the focus is on participation. But are there any strengths that we should be thinking about? Mm. I love the ICF, so don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I think the the ICF has been an incredibly powerful tool. Mm. It's been an, a really powerful tool as a framework for thinking mm. and also for really doing that clinical reasoning about the why might I do this or what else might I need to think about mm. um, when planning an intervention or planning an approach with, with families. And I think, you know, we know that... Um, as a framework and the descriptor of those categories of, you know, body structures and functions, activity, p participation, environmental factors, personal factors, they're all really crucial to our understanding of people's experiences in the world and also the impact of having a health condition mm. or a disability. Yeah. So they're really, re it's a really useful tool. Yeah. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention the F words translation yeah. as being um, another entry point for conversation, if mm. you like. So a yeah. way of thinking about and communicating with families and with children about what's important here. How can we, yeah. how can we get to the important things in life? Yeah. yeah. So this, I think for me, the single biggest disadvantage of the ICF was really um, the relationship between the framework and the classification system mm. itself and, and mm. sort of the instructions that were given, if you like, or the in interpretation that came with it around how should we think about participation versus yeah. activity and that confusion between activity and participation. and. Mm. You know, if you every time I pick up the ICF book again, I read it and I go, you know, it was it was nearly there, but because there were choices given to people, sure. people took a different decision yeah. um, going forward, yeah. and yeah. and that really just led to confusion in the literature. Yeah. Um, and for me, the fundamental distinction between activity performance, so having the skills and abilities to do a task yeah. or a set of tasks, versus being able to participate. Yeah involvement in a life situation they're yeah. not the same yeah. yeah yeah they're different things yeah um they're in different boxes in the framework that's right but they're not in different chapters no <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. so that I, I think it really just led to that 
opportunity for confusion, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I certainly know that uh, the ICF is so wonderful to bring people who are coming new into the profession to be able to talk about it mm-hmm. and you can understand what you might need to uh, assess and where you might be treating and just gives you that language. Um, but I would also agree, like, you know, I think when I read your paper and you had that lovely diagram, I remember talking to Claire Willis at length mm-hmm. with it. I'm like, talk me through this diagram. And I, and I loved that, you know, before we even get into that we'll get into that more detail today. It's just in terms of the shapes and the rounded edges and, <laughs> yeah. and how things, you know, influence each other. You're like, oh, there's so much more to it. And I guess what I'd love you to sort of tease out and help us out with this one is that the difference between attendance and involvement um, when it comes to participation. Because I know that when I start teasing out the goals that we write and I go, actually, I thought it was participation, you know, involvement, but actually it was probably just attendance. I, you know, like you can really see what it is that mm. you're doing now. Yeah. But can you talk us through those two concepts and maybe give us some examples about them as well? Yeah, absolutely. So in the family of participation-related constructs, we define participation as involvement in a life situation completely consistently with the the World Health Organization's ICF. We also then say actually there are two essential elements to participation. The first is attendance and the second is involvement, and we can need to think about them as separate constructs. Yeah. They're very related constructs. So attendance means being able to turn up in the life situation. So we are attending this interview together. I'm actually sitting in my office in Melbourne. Uh, you're in Western Australia. <laughs> you know, we, we are in the same country. We've turned up in the same situation. It's a virtual situation. Mm, yeah. So actually being able to be there is attendance. And often when we think about that or we talk to to people about their participation attendance, we ask them things like, um, what activities do you do? What's the range of activities do you do? How often do you do them? How long do you do them for? So they're sort of objective measurable construct often the attendance Mm -hmm. one you can kind of go yes I you know I do PE and I do hockey and I do whatever I do and I can count them Mm -hmm. and I can also tell you how often I do them so that's the attendance piece yeah yeah now we would say that attendance in a life situation is necessary but not sufficient Mm. for involvement Mm. so involvement is the personal subjective experience of participation while attending yeah so I've turned up to hockey, sitting on the sidelines. I never get a turn. Maybe I get to cut the oranges while I'm there. I'm probably listening to music, looking at my phone. Mm. I'm not involved. So I think, you know, that that sense of involvement can um, encompass a range of different things. So in the um, paper that you refer to, Dana, we really uh, drew on the definition for involvement related to a a, um, a review of research in child onset disability and that really drew out some of these elements related to um, engagement or um, persistence or um, potentially affect, potentially social engagement if in fact it was an activity you were doing with someone else. So there's a range of thinking, feeling, doing kind of experiences that Mm -hmm. are associated with involvement. It's a really tricky construct and we can talk about it some more, but I think the bottom line is that it's a personal experience Mm. and when we talk to children and we say what does involvement mean to you in in the situation that we're talking about or the activity that we're doing now or you're doing now, some children will really lean on the idea of what they're thinking about at the time as as being the descriptor of their involvement. Sure. Some lean on how they feel yeah. and some yeah. lean on what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And, and But they'll all have kind of bits of those pieces to it. So that sense of involvement and, and being in the moment and actually being able to be um, genuinely yeah. involved yeah. in that um, life situation. Yeah. That's such a good descriptor. And mm-hmm. as you're describing that, I think we can all think of our personal experiences. I don't know, we'll talk about experiences in a little bit, but if you have to attend a, a function by yourself, you don't know anyone. <laughs> so you're attending, you're there, but you know how you're feeling is awkward, self-conscious. Yeah. You don't know who to talk to. And, and it actually takes so much to think about how you can make that next step to be involved, to mm. feel like you're part of it. Because everyone else seems to be having a great time. They're all yeah. chatting with each other, but I'm standing here going, <laughs> I don't yeah. know what to do. Um, but it, that to take that step is a massive step Mm. so it's nice to be able to think about that you know because our kids will be experiencing that in 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 a lot of different life circumstances that we might not realize yeah absolutely and and Dana is a great example and and I literally would not know whether you were involved unless I asked you or not because you could be standing there not not 
either talking or not talking to anybody yeah. else, but still feel genuinely involved in the situation. Yeah. But I might yeah. think, oh, no, Dana's over there on the yeah. outer. I better go and see what's going on. Yeah. But you might actually be in your perfect spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah. you know, you know, soaking up the vibe, listening yeah. to the music, listening yeah. to the chatter. Yeah. I don't know what, you know. So I think you can't. We cannot make assumptions so on what true. we see. Yeah. Sometimes we have to, yeah. but we have to really recognise that we're making assumptions when we yeah. do. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I'm in, um, reminded of, Christine, is uh, conversations that I had with uh, Anne McKenzie around consumer involvement in research. And, you know, I think for a little while there, there was this idea of uh, consumer engagement and making sure that, you know, there was representation of the consumer voice in in work that researchers were doing. And, and um, I remember, you know, a few researchers were talking about that and Anne's voice just kind of cut through the room and said, no, we want them to be involved. It needs to be authentic and meaningful to them. And, you know, they they have the right to be involved in this. That's so, right, yeah. you know, from that point on, it was always, you know, consumer involvement and involving consumers in research. I think, you know, it's just reminded me of that and mm. how important mm. that is. Mm. Yeah. And I think, you know, the when we think about what the necessary um, arrangements are, if you like, for want of a better word, mm. um, to enable that, we, we can still think about that in terms of attendance and involvement. Yeah. And I often think, uh, and we'll talk about the framework perhaps a little bit more, but, you know, the the context in which things are happening matters so much. Mm. And so if we think about that research cycle that we want to involve people in, well, we know there's the, you know, deciding what to do, planning what to do, doing it, finding out the results, telling other people the results kind of steps. Mm. Well, where in the research cycle are are people able to attend? Mm. And when they attend, are they able to be involved? And in the framework, we use the the five A's to describe the context of situations. And and those first three A's of whether or not something's actually um, available, so is research going on Mm. um, that you might be able to attend, um, matters. Um, If it is available, is it accessible? So can I actually... Mm get there can I be there can I attend in some sort of way and that's not only whether it's practically accessible but actually whether it's perceived by the person yes Yes. and then the third a that's really important is can I afford it do I have the time the effort the energy Mm -hmm. the resources to actually do it and those three a's make a difference as to whether someone can attend any life Mm -hmm. situation whether it's research as a partner or something else but then once you're there we've we've ticked the box we've got our consumers they're there they're in the room with us they're attending yeah whether they're involved or not really depends on the next two A's, and that is what are the accommodations that we have made to actually genuinely make space for their voice and expertise in wow. the processes in which we're engaged. Mm-hmm. And those accommodations mean that people can start to actually take part and be involved while sitting in the chair at the table. Mm-hmm. And the next piece is whether or not the accommodations that we make are acceptable to everybody in the situation. Mm-hmm. Because if they're not acceptable to everybody, they get scuppered. Yeah. So, um, so I think that those last two A's really drive involvement. And yeah. attendance is not enough. No, you know, no. it's not enough to drive development. It's not enough mm. to actually drive a good life. Actually, we need the involvement. Yeah. Mm. So that's why we say attendance is necessary but not yeah. enough, not yes. sufficient. Yeah. Yes. need involvement. It's a good Love message. That. Yeah. And the other thing that... Um, you discuss in the family of participation related constructs is um, these intrinsic person related concepts that relate to participation, but, you know, aren't the same as participation and shouldn't be used as a, as a proxy for participation. So these things are activity, competence, sense of self and preferences. Can you talk us through why these concepts are important to consider when we think about participation? So it's always interesting to reflect back on where things came from. So, uh, again, I would say you know, we'd been researching in the area of participation for, you know, quite some years before the, we did the work around the family of participation-related constructs. And, and, it, and it really was um, when we started to look at the research that had been done to try and change participation in mm. child-onset disability that we kind of went, well, what are researchers really talking about when they yeah. talk about participation? And these, these, these were the collection of things that tended to get discussed and measured when people were trying to change participation. Sure. Yeah. 
And so what we what we said was actually, well, then are they all the same thing? Is it just a big melting pot? Or actually are these things that are quite important to participation but not the same as participation? Mm. So that that's the, the distinction that got made. So activity competence is really your skills and abilities to do the activity or the life situation that you're in or the task that you're, that you're doing. So that's whether or not it's your capacity, your capability or your performance. It's mm. actually, can I do this task to some sort of expected standard? Yeah. Somebody is expecting me to do this in a particular way or yeah. at a particular level. Mm. Can I? Yeah. Um, and of course, that can be incredibly important. It will influence participation in the future if you've got skills or if you don't have skills. It can either drive you to participate more to build the skills or it could drive you away because it's yeah. too hard. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, you can't, again, don't assume. So it's related but not the same. Yeah. Um, really, really important that that's not the same as participation, particularly for our young people who have very mm. complex impairments. Mm-hmm. But if we say you have to be independent, you have to be able to do the task for us to consider you participating, mm. then we just exclude a significant portion of the population from any one life situation. Yeah. Mm. And that's not necessary and not appropriate. Yeah. So yeah. participation something else. Yeah. So that's the sort of competence piece. And that was the that's probably the um, construct that's been measured the most instead of participation sure. in yeah. prior yeah. research. Yeah. So yeah. people, people yeah. commonly said, can they do it? Are they independent? How much help do you need? How difficult is it? Yeah. Those kinds of questions yeah. um, all drive at activity competence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sense of self is uh, another really important piece of us, right? So it's the, the sense of self phrase encapsulates things like autonomy, um, self-esteem, self-confidence, satisfaction with what I've done. Um, it's the kind of building who I am and my sense of identity of, as somebody who does or doesn't, can or can't um, be involved or participate in a particular life situation. Mm-hmm. So that, again, arises out as a consequence of participation or might drive your future participation mm, if you've got some, mm-hmm. yep. um, you know, some drive for that, some motivation for uh, a future participation. Mm. But, again, it's not attending and being involved. It's something else yeah. Yeah. and it's intrinsic to the person. Yeah. So I think this is that that's one of the distinctions. Activity competence also intrinsic to yeah, the person. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the third one is the preferences. So these are the um, you know your interests, your mo- what what you might like to do, and we you know we think about that as being something that um, develops over time as a consequence of having taken having taken part in something before, yeah. mm-hmm. um, but also it's something that drives you to do something again. Yeah. Or not. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so yep. so again, they're related but not the same. Yeah, and yeah. I don't I don't believe that preferences was very much muddled up with participation mm. in terms of measurement and past research, mm, no, but yeah. a, a certainly sense of self and activity competence were often merged and blended into it. Yes. And and if you're ever wondering then participation is always contextualized. Ah, yes. So if you're measuring yeah. something that's only about what's happening inside the person. It's something about the person. Mm, sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dissipation's and, always in context. Yes. I love that. And I can, you know, could be going down a rabbit hole here, but I can kind of see how that might have evolved over time. You know, when I when you're talking about those uh, intrinsic constructs, I'm reminded a lot of health psychology and behavior change and self-determination mm. theory and things like that. Yeah. And, you know, people really trying important. to um look at and understand the ways that we might be able to change behavior in a way that increases participation, but it's kind of that messaging's kind of all become tangled up and, and, and lost along the way sometimes. I think that's right. And, and Ash, it's a really good point because when you, the other thing about those intrinsic constructs is the the relationship and between them as mm. well as the relationship with participation so and we talk about that experience and in interpreting so it's it's you know you you act in a particular situation and that that life situation so you participate you learn something from that mm. um, you know you experience you perceive you know what that experience is which sort of contributes to your sense of self mm. but actually it's the it's the experience yeah. that is then interpreted that drives your future preferences, right? Yes. Yeah. So I've experienced something. 
my interpretation of that was that that was a dreadful experience and mm. I never want to do it again so I'm not going to mm-hmm. or it was okay I could try again yeah, or yeah. it was fabulous can I get back there yeah, yeah. you know so it's really it's it's always in the ultimately the interpretation that will drive future participation mm. Yeah. Except for those special circumstances where we have no choice. Yes. Um, and that's where those verbs between preference and participation are uh, coping and complying. So mm. choosing, wow. yes. you can choose or yeah, maybe yeah. you have to cope or comply with somebody else's choice. Yes. Um, and, and we all have to do that at some point. Yeah. Mm. And that if you're just looking at attendance, that's not something that, you know, falls out readily, is it? Because someone's showing up every week to, you know, that, that activity that yeah. they're showing up to but yeah. yeah whether they if there's an opportunity to do that again in the future they we might not be measuring it but they're not yeah. showing up to it yeah mm. and and probably we could hypothesize that um the extent to which your involvement it, it's that piece that's yes. really going to drive yeah. um you know the development of those preferences yeah. um, both not only whether you're involved but also the quality of that involvement mm. yeah. and and we know that involvement can span from not at all, to far too much. Yeah, sure. and and there is, it's not possible to be at optimal involvement all of the time mm-hmm. in any yeah. one situation. Yeah, no. <laughs> if, you know, it would just knock you out, right? You yeah. just can't do it. So. Yeah, yeah. But also, when you get when things are too much, when it's when it's costing you too much to be there, mm. that your involvements are really heightened. Mm. It's exhausting, yeah. and you have to, and you have to withdraw. Yeah. Um, or it's emotionally overwhelming, and yes. you have to withdraw. Mm-hmm. So I guess not not to think of it as a always oh, positive, yeah. always yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, or always wanting to increase it. Mm. Yeah. So it's thinking about optimal. Yeah, mm. that sweet spot. That's such an important point. So, and I think all that does. I know you've emphasised this a few times now, but experience. I feel like that word really needs to be put into this all the mm. time, and um, it's something that we need to be we need to ask and we need to understand what that might be. Cause I love how you've pulled that out. Cause it might not always be positive. It's, it's very true. Like, you know, then and, and that's where choice starts to come into play and, and there's a lot more factors into it. So I think, again, this is where moving away from just the boxes on the ICF is really useful because it's mm-hmm. not just like all or nothing. Like it's, it is the whole process and the context and the environment. Mm. And I guess the other thing is that not all life situations are positive either. That's no. right. Yeah. So, yep. so I think, you know, that if we think about the sort of um, choices that, that people make, um, mm. are we always choosing the best yeah. life situation to participate yep. in? Yep. Maybe not. Yep. Um, and and I think um, if I think about attendance and involvement, we can think of young people who are either under attending or over attending True. particular life situations mm-hmm. and the same for involvement, yeah. under involved or over involved. Yeah. So, so, I, so again, just thinking carefully about how can we support young people to be optimally involved in mm. the situations that they either need to or want to or have mm. to be taking part in. Yeah, yeah. The, the Australian Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, Christine, uh, there was a wonderful debate there with Rachel Tuvey about participation and this concept that <laughs> therapists aren't really needed. <laughs> and, you know, I think this opened up a really great conversation about the role that community has in promoting participation. So for those who weren't fortunate enough to, to attend and be involved in that conference, could you talk to us about what the main concepts <laughs> that fell out of that were. I loved it. It was so good. <laughs> it was great. I mean, it was seriously good fun. Yeah. It was um, so much fun. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was called Therapists Are Redundant. And, uh, I love the so, very provocative title. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so good. Yes. And there were, uh, so I was arguing for that, <laughs> redundant. That was hysterical, right? Yeah. He's, he's this woman talking about participation all the time. <laughs> so, um, and then we had um, uh, Rachel say that therapists were absolutely essential <laughs> um, uh, to enable participation. And then, and and really, um, I guess my my arguments were that actually we're getting in the way as therapists um, mm. because what we're doing is removing children from their natural environments, Mm -hmm. trying to teach them skills out of context, Mm -hmm. then popping them back into their natural environments and expecting it all to be perfect. We're we're there, you know, a millisecond a week, um, you know, and and I guess there's sort of perception of magic hands in some way that that makes a big difference. So a very cheeky argument. (laughs) Um, But the, the point was really was to make that actually 
living a good life is done by living your life in your yeah. natural context and yep. whatever we can do to actually build a society yep. that enables participation of all people regardless of what they bring mm. um, with their bodies yep. um, is really critical and yeah. then we won't be needed for that, yeah. okay, yeah. from a participation-focused perspective. Rachel's <laughs> argument was, hang on a minute, you guys, we're part of the solution, not part of the problem, and we got to get out of our clinics and into the community yeah. and be part of that yeah. solution. Yeah. And then we had a, an, an argument from Adam Scheinberg who said that they were definitely redundant because right. we had robots. The, robots <laughs> the whole world was going to be covered off by robots and we didn't need anything else other than our robots and our cyborgs and that was a bit scary. <laughs> With commentary like, Christine, did you really let him say that? <laughs> anyway, it was quite good fun. So good. And then actually we had the, the wonderful Gillian Saluji from yeah. South Africa finish mm. up with her with her commentary around, you know, in a low-resource setting, there are no therapists. So mm. really, what are we doing so how do we actually build um how do we actually set out on a journey with families who have uh, who are raising a child with a disability so that all of the skills and abilities that we need to raise a child to live a good life and yeah. a family mm. family to have yeah. a good life yeah. um, are there and yeah. are supported yeah. so it was a great debate it was really very good um, I think the therapists are redundant were soundly shouted down but that was because <laughs> there were too many therapists in the audience <laughs> That's the problem <laughs> <laughs> so no, it was uh, good fun. the commentary online was yes. hilarious but Spherical. I loved how <laughs> I just remember we're all in there like da 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 yes. Typing away. It was Keyboards so burning. But the point really there was, I mean, I love it when you have a debate. It's, it was lighthearted. It was all very fun, as yeah. you can all tell. But the point was to think broadly and that yes. um, we need to think about the person's life and who's in that life. And yes, it doesn't matter how much therapy you do do, like it, it's it's still not their life. You know, you're not you're not there with them all the time. And, and I loved how you brought in the whole community. I mean, I think you listed, you know, like it, artists and people mm. like people, community workers. You know, you listed so many people that I just went, oh, yeah. 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 Context. And I think yeah. we have to be really careful not to get in the way. Yeah. Mm. So, yeah. so I don't think therapists are redundant, <laughs> no. by the way. But yeah. I definitely think we can get in the way. Yeah. And I think we can – it can be problematic and yeah. we really do have to think. And, again, if you go back to that framework and I talked about, though, you know, to what extent are these life situations available mm. and accessible mm. and, you know, that young people can be involved in them. Yeah. We can't be part of the problem. We have yeah. to be part of the solution. Yeah. So yeah. so how do, we, how do we do that in a way that is community building community ca capacity building yeah. so that we're not needed yeah. so i'd like yeah. us i'd like us to be redundant in any one lovely. person's life yes yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah. That, yeah. yeah but not uh, not perhaps in general <laughs> <laughs> look i think that's that's something i really wanted to sort of you know round everything up with today and, and i'm very conscious we don't take too much more of your time but i do really want to just to finalize um just sort of finish this up and talk a little bit about that in the context of of therapy. So a lot mm. of our listeners, you know, um, and, and families would be accessing therapy services. And, you know, we often talk about this hands-off approach. We know all the clinical guidelines are in that approach because we want children to be more active, self-generated, mm -hmm. you know, movements and in within context. But attending lots of therapy sessions all of the time to learn, you know, body structure and function skills, to stand, to independently balance on one leg or to reach a certain distance – it's a hard thing to sort of shift, I guess, because uh, there are, you know, different modes of training from therapists so that that comes into play. Um, there's parents going, I really want them to tick these milestones off so that we can actually, you know, get out there. And so they'll spend so much time in their first five years of life. And we always talk about the importance of early intervention. So mm. they've got those messages going on as well. Um what's your advice there? How do we, mm. can we help people to navigate through this when, when they especially when the focus early on is so body structure and function focus, so activity, because it's just kind of like, if we can fix this, if we can get through this part of it, this is what it would mean. And it's, it's quite a mm. challenge in that time. <laughs> it's a big challenge. I think yeah. you've, I think you've yeah. almost answered it for yourself. I think, Dana, that it's how, it's what are we teaching yeah. parents instantly? They, um, uh, have a child or experience a child has an illness or an injury or something happens, yeah. I think our our immediate um, interactions with families often couched in the fix-it language. Mm, yeah. And so we, 
we immediately set the scene for that mm. as opposed to what's important to your family? What is it? What's your day-to-day -day life like? How? Mm. What is it that's going to be um, provide all of the best opportunities for, for, for that within your family? Yeah. And it's not just us as health professionals. Our whole community has a fix-it yeah. um, set of language. Mm. And yep, so, yep. Our, you know, and that's partly about, we see that because we see that disability is quite invisible or, or yeah. put aside in yeah. many, many ways. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're sort of giving, the, giving that message that this is not okay, you've got to be fixed, right? Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. has yep. to be the same. Yeah. And so that's a very powerful message mm. that we have to fight against from day one. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So my advice is to find out what's valued and meaningful for families yep. about their day-to-day -day life yes. and how is it that we provide the types of enablers mm. and support systems and help parents to understand what works to help their child learn mm. what is it that they need because yeah. if we hold all the answers and we need to deliver the answers mm. then parents can never solve the problems for themselves and yeah. children can't either mm -hmm. yeah. so they're dependent on us yeah. Yeah. so we have to get away from that and we have to start working in the environments in which children live their lives yeah. inside their families inside their early childhood centers yeah. um and it's and it's not to take away the skill sets of therapists they're going to be essential yeah. but it's to challenge therapists to deliver their skill sets in a completely other way yeah so it's a rethink so you don't lose your skills, mm. but really think about how you're going to apply them. Mm. That is enabling and informing and supporting in context mm -hmm. because that's participation as means. Yeah. 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 And those families grow and change over time as well. And those, you know, those babies become toddlers who become children and then adolescents and adults. And so the, the role of the therapist has to change along that journey as well, mm. doesn't it? I, I wonder if actually our role should be the same from the get-go. Mm. And, you know, and I think I think it depends. I think that needs a bit of thinking through for, mm. for each, um, you know, situation that you're in because if you start with participation, if you start with the end in mind, mm. then and if maybe if you start to think about your role as a therapist as teacher mm. rather than fixer. Yeah. Mm. And then actually handing over and empowering children and families to have the knowledge and skills and capacities yeah. to solve their own problems. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So of course that's not going to work if you need surgery. But you know that but I think if we're thinking therapy and we're thinking about sure. building capacity to live a good life, yeah. which yeah. is what we are, yeah. then I think we have to think in a slightly other way from the very first day. Yeah. And it's all about our language. I think sometimes you think about in the teenage years, people talk about participation. And it makes more sense because mm. they're they're older and they're doing all these things. But it's been such a journey. And if we can start it right from the beginning, mm. um, I remember our talk with um, Jen Pryor. Uh, she's she's a mother of a now sixteen year old girl, cerebral palsy, and she said she's not broken. Uh, she I don't have to fix her. She wants to live her life full to the max. And she's always had, you know, she, she talked about her journey and there was grieving, of course, and she went through a lot of that, but she also wanted to enable her right from the beginning. And she's a very well-balanced child now and she has all the normal teenage things, but she's very much a part of the world and, and that's that approach and that mm. inspires me. And I yeah. think, you know, to do that from the beginning, but I, I think I, I take the challenge and kind of go, yeah, we need to think about that right from the beginning. Um, and make sure our language is right because we don't need to go, oh, the alignment's not quite right, so we need to fix that first mm -hmm. before they can stand yeah. and play. I'm like, no, yeah. no, no, yeah. we're playing. <laughs> no, let's play because yeah. then we will learn to stand and walk and balance yeah, that's and get right. strength. Yeah. 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 So, so what's getting in the way of the playing and, yeah. and resisting breaking down what's getting in the way of the playing with the answer in the child? So yeah. every explanation you have for what's getting in the way of something mm. That, that usually we come up with explanations in the child first, okay? So this child's not playing because oh, they don't have balance, they don't wow. have strength. Mm. So every time you come up with an explanation in the child, you must have an explanation in the context or environment to mm. balance it. Oh, so wow. if you, yep. you must because yep. that's the piece yep. that actually is much more amenable to change. Mm -hmm. So no, no, no lonely explanations all in the child. I love yeah. it. It's got to be matched with one in the environment. Yeah, love it. This, this child has low levels of cognition. Yep. Yeah. The environment does not provide the information in a way that this child can access. Yeah. You have to balance them every time you do something. Mm. Gosh, I couldn't have landed in a better place. 
See, I told you, everyone. Yep. After you talk to Christine, you walk away and you think deeply about it. We've all experienced it now. <laughs> We've all experienced it now. <laughs> Christine, I think we could talk to you for a very long time, but we are <laughs> conscious of your time and much needed in so many different places. So, um, you've, let me, you've let me talk on and on and on. So, oh, thank no, you. We'll <laughs> really, we'd love to continue. So, we'll probably have to like tee in another one at another Part point two. in time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Christine, thank you so much. That was so enriching, so inspiring. I've taken away so much once again. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. To all of the listeners, remember researchworks.net if you want to have a copy of our run sheet notes from what we discussed today. And of course, our links to all the things that Christine are doing too on our website, researchworks.net. And there's a CPD form there they can fill out as well if you want to keep this as part of a record of your PD requirements. Yeah, but for now, yeah. <laughs> I think we will thank you again for your time, Christine. And no, thank you for, for everything you've talked through with us today. Mm. And we will see you again next time. Talk to you all again then. Bye. 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 Bye.